It might have been the body doesn't lie, but I've since decided that's not true. Lydia, welcome. It, it, God, I can't believe you're here virtually. Are you kidding? It's my pleasure to be here. Lydia, I called this session Skin Side Out <laughs> because I couldn't decide between the way you teach writing from the body, but also your absolute disdain for, maybe that's the overstating it, but like these rigid rules. I'm very mechanical about writing. I firmly believe that if you mind the craft, the art will take care of itself. If I said that to you, what would be your response to that? What's, what is your take on that approach? You're right for some people. I guess where I'm coming from is my beef isn't with the traditions or our history in literature and art or rules that have been developed that have produced great material. My beef isn't that all of that exists and it's useful to many, many people. And I promise I don't want to take any of the rules or traditions away from anybody if that is beloved to you. Where I come in is yes, but, or yes, and. <laughs> How I come in from the side or from underneath is I'm not very attracted anymore to the idea of the universal because in my lifetime, I have noticed that there are certain bodies and certain stories and certain languages and certain experiences that get silenced or pushed to the side or watered down or injured or destroyed in the name of certain kinds of storytelling that is legitimized and lionized. I'm gonna be 58 this summer and it's taken me this many years to go ahead and embrace the idea that there might be other bodies and experiences and stories that connect to different kinds of forms. And I don't feel too nutter about it because I have proof. <laughs> so I'm going to get kind of weird and serious for a minute because you come back to bodies a lot. You're not being metaphorical when you say bodies in writing, are you? No. I'm being as literal as I can be. I'm probably beyond literal when I talk about bodies. And another premise might be my idea is every single one of us is carrying everything that's ever happened to us right now in our bodies somewhere on your body. That your body has kind of been a palimpsest of your life. And if you go to your body, and ask it questions, it has answers, or it has secrets, or it has repressions, or it has the pain in your spine or your neck, or it has abilities and differently abled places where stories might be hiding. And so when I think of the body, I don't just think, are you well or sick? Or are you in good shape and svelte or not? What stories are you carrying? What are you holding? And how can you access it? And maybe the rules we've been taught help you access some of the stories, but maybe we need some other ways to access the rest of the stories. And I don't know about you, but I'm often writing the surface story and I make it really pretty and beautiful. And I'm good at that. And I'll do anything to the surface to make it really gorgeous. And it's because I don't wanna tell what's underneath which is messier and uglier <laughs> and trickier. And so to access that deeper underneath material, I'm just saying there might be other ways to get at it, to access it, to scratch at it. So I want to get out of my comfort zone. I'm sitting and I'm writing something and I have these nagging ghosts, right? And I'm trying to write something and it's all superficial. I don't know how to put my guts on the page. I mean, what is your advice to someone like me who's really tightly wound up in the mechanics of things? Well, it's not entirely different from, say, other people's meditation practices, because I just start asking kind of internal and meditative questions of my body, like as a warm up, when I'm sitting down to write, I might get into some of those deep breath drop yourself down a level place and close your eyes and ask myself, where are you most in your body right now? 
and maybe that day it's my neck or another day it's my hand. I'll start writing around hand or neck as the warm up. And nine times out of 10, something else is there besides just the warm up. Um, and it's more intuitive, it's more free flowing practice. Some people hate it and don't want to do it. That's fine. I'm not going to make you, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, but what I found from doing it over and over again, year after year, is that I'm starting to access what else is in my hand? What about my father's hands? What about my mother's hands? When has my hand been useful and strong? When has my hand been the source of trauma or pain? What secrets is my hand holding? Suddenly, it gives me another path into the story I'm working on, which may or may not be about hands, right? Plus I get extra material that is about hands. <laughs> and so I guess a good way to describe it is it's just another path. It's another access route that's a little more intuitive. It's a little more free form. It's a little more jazz improv. It's a little more, as my friend Ross Gay would say, digression based rather than logic or thinker brain based. And that there might be magic in the digressions. There might be magic in the intuition that takes you to the deeper story. So that's the theory. And um, you can test me on this with your own body. <laughs> you can try it later after I'm gone. Um, but you have to like contact me if something cool happens. I want to know. I was reading your memoir and somewhere midway through you began a sentence with, I don't want to tell you this. And then you proceed to tell us. And that strikes me as like the most, the most direct way to get out of your comfort zone, to sit down and write, I don't want to tell you this, and then what follows from that. Is that resonating at all? But oh, yeah. I would say that's a wonderful portal for anyone. Just the sentence, I don't want to tell you this, something starts coming up your shoulders into your throat. <laughs> like, uh-oh, it's the things. I mean, if I made you do a free write right now, something would come out of you. I don't use the word prompt anymore because it feels too much like somebody's kicking me in the ass. So I changed the word prompt to portal because then I can feel like I'm moving through or entering something. And they're worth exploring whether you put them in the world or not because they're bridges to opening experience up. And all we have with each other is, can we make a bridge to each other or not? So. It's good exercise whether or not you end up sharing the actual thing. One of the things in the book, Chronology of Water, has to do with bad mistakes I've made, like getting a DUI. And so you can see why I would say, I don't want to tell you. The chapter where you described the DUI, the roadside sobriety test, is one of the few places I actually laughed out loud. I understand your reaction. And even I was thinking that at the time, like, wow, this is just like a movie of a movie of a movie of a movie and you're just the absurd central idiot <laughs> i think if nothing else just this idea of as a portal not a prompt i don't want to tell you this that is i think powerful i'd also try this 15 second meditation where you figure out where you're most on your body right now and then give yourself an assignment where you write six 100 word segments on or about or memory or anything that body part for yourself in a nonfiction way or for a character you're working on in a story. Just write six 100 word segments on like a brief history of hands, brief history of shoulders or my head or whatever it is and see what comes out. That'd be another one if the power goes out. One of the things that has helped me in, in running workshops over the years is I start to see common clusters of, I don't want to call them mistakes, but certain habits that come from people. And I can use those as ways of developing portals. I won't say prompt anymore. Developing those things or assignments or exercises. And I'm curious if over the years with these kinds of portals, do you notice patterns, uptight, straight white guys will always write about X. People who have a certain kind of pain will write about Y. Do you notice that at all? Obviously, I'm not going to ask about specific people, but do you notice patterns at all? I'm curious. Yeah, let's talk about Chuck. What did I just say? <laughs> I was... <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
uh, <laughs> of course, you know why the answer is, of course, because that's the human default, right? All of us, no matter who we are, have a set of defaults that we return to. And the idea is to shake ourselves back up so we quit doing that. You know, we quit defaulting to, my father was a dick to me. I shall now write about that again, <laughs> you know. And, and how do we get under that? And so another good tool to bring to any piece of writing you're working on is when you get a draft going, when you're feeling pretty good about it, you're feeling kind of sassy about it, like, I got this. Just apply this simple question to the material. And what is the story underneath that? I know it sounds like a simple, so what question, but if you make yourself answer it in a one sentence answer, and then ask it again and make yourself answer it till you run out of one sentence answers, you'll know if you've bypassed something else in the storytelling. And again, it could be for a poem, it could be for a short story, it could be for an essay, doesn't matter what form you're working in. But again, the idea is to, did you go down to get it? Or did you make a slick surface? Or did you default to the story you've been telling over and over again? Or is there something underneath that's unusual that shakes it up? Because I found if you identify patterns, okay, that's my default, that's code for comfort zone. In one of Chuck's workshops, I took all my students, I looked at everyone's work, even the stuff that I hadn't read as, as assignments, and I broke everyone up into big groups. These people are all writing in the trendy first person present. These people are all writing in the third person past those are the biggest categories, but then other clusters that I noticed, these rote habits, and I said, okay, everyone in group A, write in the first person. You've never written in the first person, do it. All of you, write in the third person. All of you, whatever, whatever the rote habit was, I made them reverse it. You've never heard this much kicking and screaming from a group of people in your life, and I have never seen such remarkable work come out of them. That's right, because you were giving them the gentle shaking <laughs> motion. You were shaking them up a little. And it's a thing we have to learn to do to ourselves, because mostly writing is sitting all alone in a room in your underwear with your laundry behind you like mine is. Luckily, you can't see it. <laughs> uh, you have to learn to do it to yourself by any means possible. Suppose I do these things. I get out of my comfort zone. I ask what's underneath the story, or I meditate and, and have whatever body part bubbles to the surface, or I begin with, I don't want to tell you this. From a craft standpoint, how do I shape that, or how do I weave that into what I'm working, or do I necessarily have to? You should know that I'm working on an anti-craft book. <laughs> so I need to cop to that first. I'm suspicious of what we've been calling craft because back to the first set of questions, I notice it's made a hierarchy that keeps some voices loud and present and other voices off to the side. And so that's upsetting to me. But I do understand your question. So that has more than one answer. What's more important in terms of questions of form and content and to your question about craft is what did I learn? about either form or content that complicates what I'm working on, which is another version of shaking up, you know, not moving straight to your default. So if I did six 100 word fragments on hands and I ask, what did I learn from those six fragments? It could be that I discovered an important theme about how violence can come from a hand and tenderness comes from a hand too. And I want to explore the theme of violence and tenderness not being opposites like we wish they were. Or it could be that what I learned from the six 100 word fragments could go into a character who becomes more invested with something they do with their hands. They're a painter or a farmer or a writer or a boxer. And so there are literal ways to incorporate going off and finding intuitive, interesting material. There are literal ways to incorporate it into storytelling. Um, so themes, characters, style. Did any style moves come up that I can learn from and amplify in other work that 
seems to have nothing to do with it. I've learned the most about style from free writes that weren't the main material I was working on. And then I bring that back to the main material and ask, well, how can I amplify the style? So form and content questions made literal from the more intuitive, more dreamscape kind of exploration. You talk about the traditional practice sometimes will marginalize certain types of people, voices or experiences or storytelling. When I saw you read one of your introductory remarks about the small backs of children was you said you wanted to immediately dismiss this notion of having a central character. So being able to embrace some of what you're talking about, how does someone like that who have been traditionally marginalized, how does someone then go out into the big wide world and start submitting manuscripts? One thing I'd like us to at least imagine could be true if we were writing less from the space of individual ego and more from the space of if one of us jams our foot in the big door how could we shoulder it open for the person writing next to us that requires you to ask yourself what is a writer and why am I doing this differently then I want to be rich and famous and top dog (laughs) of writer land. But another thing I'd say is, even though times are sort of horrible right now, we live in a great time too, because the idea of a polyphonic novel or nonfiction book, or the idea of a nonfiction or fiction book in fragments, or the idea of a book that's a hybrid of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, image, those books are all over the place now. And so it becomes our job as readers and writers to support those authors, buy their books, go underneath Amazon to make lateral rhizomic relationships with writers who are being kept out of the top five, Or if you manage to get into one of the big houses, start making some demandments. I like that word. (laughs) Different kinds of relationships with publishing. Ask who their publicity team is and ask if they're all white. Ask who you're going to get to work with and how and when and why. And what's their goal with the work? Is it to open more doors for writers in your community? Or is it to make themselves look good? Like these are different questions we can bring to the whole process. Or like if you have a friend whose book is about to be published and it's in the pre-order stage, tell everyone on the planet to pre-order because that can change a print run of 1,000 to 5,000 or 10,000. And a person who might not be headed toward the great pie in the sky suddenly could be. So there's just so much we can do. I guess it's a form of literary activism and community that asks you to think beyond yourself as the only important matter. Do you know what I mean? I do. You're describing networking in the non-slimy, cheesy, insincere way. I hear you. I have taken to thinking of what I'm talking about as tree roots or mushroom mycelium, you know, this lateral form of connecting with each other rather than the kind of networking where you're shooting some stuff upward. There's one quote in your book that jumped out at me. You said, look, I'm trying not to creep you out or shock you. I'm trying to be precise. And that landed really well with me. So when you're trying to be precise, can you talk about that? So someone finally has this stuff bubbling up, you know, thinking about their body or saying, I don't want to tell you this, but, and then telling. What would you say about making those kinds of ideas precise or honing them? So when I wrote that particular kind of sentence in Chronology of Water, especially, I was coming up against the pressure of my culture to tell the story nicely and in clean and proper terms as a woman or a person inhabiting the space we call woman, because I don't think it's a biological essentialism woman. And, and so that space would ask me to not talk about periods as literally as they occur, or poo, or pee, or getting a DUI, or getting drunk, or you know the nastier, messier experiences I've had in my body that we call woman. And so when I put 
the foulness or mess on the page. I think Joshua Moore and I have this in common. It's not meant to surprise or shock anyone. Those are the precise terms of the life I've lived. And just because I'm occupying the space of woman doesn't mean I need to tone it down or get nicey or beautiful if what I have to tell you about is rage or shit. Um, those are precise words and precise experiences, and we need to invent the languages for them. So that's what I mean by precise. The opposite of stepping into a, a language and a story that's sitting there already, that if you step into it, people will give you a crown and call you a princess. There's that sitting there waiting for all of you if you want to be a writer. Or can you invent the precise language that corresponds to only your experience and only your body? And what would that look like? It might look different. I mean, even Emily Dickinson had to invent a language that corresponded to her experience. And when people first saw it, they went, what's that? That's weird. Let me bounce it out to everyone here because there's a lot of people. You have the one and only Lydia Yuknovich here. Lydia, yeah. it's Joy. Can you hear me? Yes. First of all, I love this whole thing that you said earlier about the body as a palimpsest. Yeah. Oh my God, can you talk about that? All you really need to know is that it's a many layered surface. And for me, it gets back to that idea that our experiences write us. They've written themselves upon us. I'm also a person with tattoos and piercings, so um, body language and body writing is a ritual importance to me. But the idea is that those layers will take you a lifetime to explore, which is why you'll never run out. Mm. And it's like a tree, you know, tree rings or root systems. You're not going to run out by turning back to your body now and again and asking the questions of the layers. And you can ask them scientifically, you can ask them religiously, you can ask them in terms of memory, you can ask them in terms of pain or trauma, you can ask them in terms of joy, you can ask them in terms of, do I know languages I'm unaware I know? You can ask them about ancestors, you can ask them about history. That's what I meant by palimpsest. It's also just one of my favorite words. Yes. <laughs> I just like it. It is. Thank you. I love you, Joyce. I love you. I miss you. <laughs> Liz asked to tell, you, uh, tell us more about your anti-craft book. So it's not that I want our prior understandings of craft to die. What I'm most interested in is what are the new forms and the new practices that come from this moment forward? And could some of us talk about that and stir that up? And I don't think that that's opposed to what we've inherited. I just think it's in addition to what we've inherited. And there are just 10,000 examples that have to do with how this moment, this zeitgeist that we live in is producing its own forms and content that aren't the same as what's come before. So you can both draw from what's come before, or you could start asking, what is the now offering that we can pay forward to whoever's after us? Because ain't none of us going to make it past this one version of this one life. So why not stir up what we have to offer and let that loose in the world? Amy asks, what is your opinion on the mind-body when writing? Meaning, do you ever experience conflict between the mind and body? <laughs> That's my whole life. I am so not Zen. I'm like Zenless. Or I have, you know, like I can hit it for three seconds or so, but then I fail miserably. I wish the question was about swimming or dreaming, because then I could answer it well. If I'm swimming or dreaming, I'm in a space of pure imaginal and pure physical kind of oneness to speak of it in the best terms. When I'm sitting to write, I'm in struggle. I'm at war with myself. Maybe I have an hour where I'm really, you know, I, I had some scotch going and I hit an hour where I was riding high and beautiful. And then I read it the next day and I'm like, oh dear, <laughs> what is that mess? But I felt the previous day, like it was, I was really rocking it. And so what I feel is something like, 
get playful with the struggle. That works better for me than trying to become one with my mind and body, which I'm a terrible failure at. So I just shift the coordinates and ask myself, can I get playful with the struggle? Can I make puzzles for myself or challenges narratively that I then have to solve and figure out? So every novel I've ever written, for example, I write myself straight into an impossibility. I write myself into a corner. There is no hope of surviving. And then it's fun. Then I can like make whatever I want happen because I've made this impossible set of coordinates that, well, nobody could tell the story. And if you tell me that, I'm in. If you say, this is not possible, Lydia, you can't write this, no one will understand, then I'm in, then I wanna do it. That doesn't mean that will work for other people, but I will put a marker down for playfulness, getting play into your struggle. Jessica's asking, in your experience in writing messy but precise memory about family, what advice do you have writing precisely when these people might still be alive? If we're talking nonfiction, sure. It has helped me or been productive for me to not write directly at the trauma or difficulty or even person, but to write through image and metaphor and figurative means. For example, in the chronology of water, the things my father actually did to us aren't in the book. There's no sentence that names exactly what he did to us. But there's a scene about going to get a Christmas tree with him. And there's a scene about a suitcase in the garage and an encounter. And there's a scene about learning to ride a bike. And there's a scene about going fishing. And so I pumped the precision, precisely what happened to me, into creating for you, the reader, the feeling of what happened to me through figurative means. You know it's true because it happens when you read a poem and you arrive at the bigness of the idea with a very small distilled version that may or may not name something literally. Or if you go stand in front of a Rothko painting that's just a giant wall-sized red and purple and maybe you're moved to tears. And then you leave the building and you go have lunch. You're like, what the hell just happened to me? <laughs> you can move the literal difficulty and talk, writing about other people and writing about family and whatever. You can move it more fluidly if you lean on your figurative options more than your literal options. Val's asking, is negative space part of precision? I think so. I mean, if we all sat and meditated on that for a second, we're so addicted to the idea that you have to say the big thing really loud when, you know, more than half of life happens in the periphery. Or if you're like me, a big neon sign that's flashing the truth directly behind your head so everybody else can see it but you. Because <laughs> I'm a hard case. You've got to like, the universe has to drop a car in front of me for me to go, oh. <laughs> Consider what that means, negative space. Some of the story is in the periphery. Some of the story is behind you. Some of the story is down the street. Some of the story may live in a pocket by the trash cans out back. The story doesn't always have to be again, centered on the ego of the character or the narrator. The story is also happening all around you all the time. Melissa asks, I find it hard to be brave enough to write out shameful things of my past. Do you have advice about how to get beyond this? And parenthetically, she says, you are a huge, all caps, inspiration. That's kind of you. And yes, I have a great one. My sister gave me this gift a few days ago. She said, next time you feel shame, of any sort about writing or anything, just imagine that your cheeks turn into blooming roses. And it made me laugh when she said that, but it's working. Like I was feeling shame about something two days ago and I was sitting there in the shame and then I imagined these weird, unruly, blooming, beautiful roses coming out of my cheeks and it made me laugh. I was like, shame deflated. <laughs> And then the less funny thing I would say about that, Melissa, is that shame is the story they want you to enter. Shame is the story as it plays out out there in the world that those who would keep us quiet want us to step into. 
And so you're the only person on the planet who understands you don't have to tell their story. The story sitting out there waiting for you, this shame story, it's not yours. It's somebody else's projection. And so do you really want to get to the end of your life having lived or told someone else's story? As a woman writer, I find it interesting that people will call my writing, quote, brutal, but not precise. This frustrates the hell out of me. Is there a difference between brutal and precise, though? How do I avoid, quote, shocking the reader while being precise? Thanks. Heart emoji. Hi, Amy. I love you. <laughs> yeah, that word's been used on me all the time. But uh, no offense to any white males in the space, but all of literary history is filled with white male brutality, and we call that literature. So I would just say, take the brutal. If somebody says that to you, take it, embrace it, and just keep insisting on your own precision. And this idea that somebody can tell us that it's brutal or shocking, you know, I think books should happen to you. And so if the person reading your material is shaken and it makes them say stupid things, okay, <laughs> you know, after the book leaves my house, it's not mine anymore. And did it make something happen to the reader? Cool. And I'll say this again, nobody becomes a writer to bathe in likes. You're not going to be universally loved by every single person who reads what you write. So figure out what it is you want to be making out in the world. What, what besides bathing in adoration, it's a useless and impossible task. And so I embrace the brutal thing, Amy, and you should too. The next time somebody says something like that to any of us, it's like, Lydia, your writing is so brutal. Just go like this, go, I know, it's so precise, isn't it? One little tweak and you're golden. I get this a lot. Lydia, your writing is so violent. And I say, mm. I know, it's so hard to unwrite the violence that we've been conditioned to understand as living the life. I just shift it to the, what's true and precise is I'm unwriting violence. I'm not doing what they said but you take what they say and just turn it. You got this. You all do. Somebody asked if I were going to rewrite the chronology of water today. Would it be different? Of course it would be different. Oh my God, who wrote that book? But this is something I love about literature and writing. It's alive. Not only would it change if I wrote it over again, I kind of wish they'd let me. I would love to just say same book, same title, same cover open the book. Surprise! It's completely different. Not only would it change, and it would for you too, if you wrote something over again at a different time and place, but it changes in the reader. I reread read books all the time my whole life, and the whole story changes because I've changed and because literature stays alive if you let it. It doesn't go static. It doesn't die. It changes between reading and writing and bodies and books. I do teach classes um, as, as Craig was so beautiful to point out, I invented a writing center here in Portland called corporeal writing. And I love it when people mispronounce it because they usually say corporal. And then I can picture myself with like a whip. <laughs> corporal writing. But it's corporeal. And we're online. You can look it up. And there's all kind of classes taught by me and a host of much more interesting, more brilliant people. Would you recommend writing about or through body parts that you are most familiar with or that you have the most memories associated with? Or is it better to go with a body part that you don't think about as often where you may need to work harder to pull back the layers? I prefer to go random, to put the randomizer on it by doing the little meditation thing first and just asking what's up for me. Like if it's my gut today, I'll go to gut. Whereas if I think about it really hard, I'll pick the same body area every time. But if you do a little mini meditation, you can find where you're feeling something on your body and ask what the secrets are in there, what memories live in there. I like the randomizer version. Wow. Lydia, this is one of those hours that just vanished. I'm still just over the moon that you wanted to join us. You've got a new collection of short stories out, Verge, correct? Yes, Verge. Okay. but. It's out of my hands now, therefore, not about me. Okay, we'll put it in your hands, everyone. Do you have one mic drop chunk of wisdom you want to leave us with? 
Yes, never surrender. Well, that was easy. Oh, I, I'm going to tattoo it on my face. Thank you, everyone. The turnout is astounding. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much for the pleasure of all your company. And Craig, baby, we're going to cross paths again. Take care, everyone. Thank you again. We will see you hopefully next month. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.